G'day all and welcome to the Mind Lab Show. This is where you'll get all the tricks, tips and deals you need for your next gold prospecting or treasure hunting adventure. And what a cracker show we've got coming again tonight. We're going to head to Charters Towers in the search for gold. We're going to keep your gear in top shape with our tech tip giveaway. Ten of our plastic sand scoops and some bucket hats. So if you're heading to the beach, keep watching. Check out some happy customer finds from Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt and Rhonda looks at the role of women on the gold fields in gals on the gold fields. I'm Gold Digger Dave, let's get digging. There's nothing like the sound of gold under the coil when I'm out there swinging my detector. There's nothing like the sound of gold under the coil when I'm out there swinging my detector. Okay, well look, I was hoping that uh, the gold price was going to continue its steady climb, but uh, once again it's gone up a little bit, uh, gone up to around about that 2550 maybe a little bit more, and it started to come back down again, which is uh, unfortunate for us, but uh, it's still looking good with the Indian gold buying season in full swing, and you'll also see the inflation rising again around the world will uh, make the gold price hopefully go a little higher. So look, speaking of gold, um, I found uh, this came up uh, in the last week or so, actually a couple of weeks ago now on this one, it was 73.1 grams. This is a nugget that was found uh, in WA just recently, I think it was somewhere around Kalgoorlie they were telling me. Um, a great nugget, 73 grams, so that's uh, just over two ounces of um, gold there. And the two ounces of gold uh, would be valued at around about $5,000 or possibly a little bit more uh, because of its uh, nugget of value. So I always say when you're hunting for gold, persistence pays off. Well, now I did say persistent pays off because only just last weekend the same gentleman went back out and he discovered this one here. So that nugget there you're looking at uh, is around about the 42 grams uh, mark on it. It's a fantastic uh, nugget, but it was found within five uh, feet or five meters, sorry, of where the first nugget we showed you was. Also, there were a couple of small pieces around with the nugget as well. So that's from a previously worked area. They're using a GPZ 7000 and it was only found literally seven days from the previous find. So it just shows going back over the ground carefully, working thoroughly and diligently as this gentleman always does, it makes his own luck and he scored himself maybe seven and a half, eight thousand dollars worth of gold in a couple of weekends wandering around with a mine lab metal detector. So that was uh, rather interesting. It just goes to show you there's still lots of that stuff out there. You've just got to be persistent and walk over it. Now let's move on to our gold coin and treasure news uh, next. And look, if you're hoping for uh, uh, get more bang for your buck uh, when you're out to buy a detector, be careful what you wish for. Because what's come up here is the story that appeared in the Charlotte Observer, a North Carolina newspaper that was first published way back in 1886. The reports are in the pub one picking and poking around with their metal detector in Tennessee. In uh, this case, uh, though, they turned up what the paper described as being, and I quote, the type of historical artefact best left alone, a live and unstable World, II, World War II mortar round. Now, the story goes that the big boom that followed a controlled detonation was heard more than 13 miles away. You heard me right, an explosion that was heard 13 miles away. There were no injuries when the controlled explosion occurred about 40 miles northeast of Nashville. Experts decided that the mortar was too unstable to move long distance, to move a long distance. Now, if it was that unstable, can you imagine what might have happened if the avid detectorist had got a bit too enthusiastic digging with a heavy shovel? Phew! But the report also goes on to say that a photo taken before the bomb was detonated showed it was caked with fresh mud indicating the finder dug it out of the ground without realising the risk. 
Police reported through Facebook that the bomb was likely left over from when the area was used as a training ground during World War II. Um, and now look for another older report from the Artnet Online uh, with the sort of headline that detectorists just love to see. Amateur treasure hunter may get huge payout after uncovering an Iron Age chariot that has flooded or flawed experts with the find that's been dated way back to AD 2575. Again, it was found with a trusty metal detector and that led to history and that led a history lover to uncover the 2000 year old chariot buried underneath farmland in South Wales. Artnet News states that the amateur treasure hunter looks likely to receive a major payout for the unprecedented find. The bloke with the detector was Mike Smith, who had apparently been detecting for about 30 years. It seems Mike discovered a chariot in the Welsh town of Pembrokeshire and that when he found the pieces of ancient chariot, at first he thought he'd come across a medieval brooch. But when he returned the next day, he discovered more pieces and realised the brooch was actually part of a Celtic horse harness. The report confirms a court had ruled to legally protect the historic find and heard confirmation that Smith had indeed discovered an ancient burial ground. Mike was hoping for maybe even a six-figure or seven-figure reward uh, for the treasure from the government. As much as one million pounds or maybe 1.3 million Aussie dollars. The Celtic chariot discovered is reported to have been an iconic element of wartime militar for Iron Age tribes with some high-ranking chiefs even buried with their chariots, horses and weapons. And get this, the story finishes with, by saying the last year another Iron Age chariot was found still upright with horse skeletons in leaping positions as though they were about to jump out of the grave. Mike Smith reported to have said that he will split the cash from the owner uh, with the owner of the land where he found the buried treasure. What a great find and what a fantastic yarn. Look, uh, stick around uh, because shortly I want to get to our viewer giveaway, but first I wanted to show you something uh, special. So we're always looking for new segments and things uh, that uh, we can bring to you that might be of interest. And one of the segments we're thinking about was called Something Special. Now, this was uh, some gold maybe that you had found and made into something. Um, items like that that will help well, bring some joy and share your experience with other prospectors. So the first one I've got here uh, actually came from Corey, who's on the feed tonight. And Corey's, uh, this will give you an idea of the kind of story that we're actually looking for. Corey sent us a photo of a gold, beautiful gold ring uh, that means so much to him. And Corey writes, this is my great grandfather, Alfred uh, McGee's ring. It's made from gold found by my great, great grandfather, James McGee in Ballarat around 1890, is what we're thinking. James was born in Darlesford in 1861 and Alfred in Ballarat in 1900. The family moved to the west coast of New Zealand in the early 1900s where James and later Alfred worked in the gold mines in Waiatua. I think I pronounced that right, but Alfred passed away in 1987 and the ring was passed to my father who passed it to me in 2013 and it has been on my finger every day since. Now look, how special is that? The gold's come all that way back, it's been made into a ring, it's been passed down through the family. Those kind of stories, and I'm sure there's more of them out there that uh, you can certainly share with us uh, and you might get it up on to uh, a segment like this. So, uh, if it tends to work out and there's a few people who uh, want to share something special, we may even be able to work out a prize or uh, find some giveaways or something like that for uh, anyone who can send something in. So, that is something special. Uh, very, very good story. Thanks very much for sharing with us, Corey. Now, we're coming along next time. We're going to look at uh, our viewer weekly viewer giveaway this time. So, this week, uh, I've got some prizes going out. It's a fantastic viewer giveaway. I'm going to get rid of 
Uh, some of these sand scoops, if you were watching last week, you would have seen on our Facebook uh, the load of sand scoops that came in. We're going to give away 10 of them tonight, plus these are uh, Miner's Den Mine Lab. I'll just swing it back around that way. Miner's Den Mine Lab bucket hats. So there's 10 of them going out, one of them for uh, uh, five for Facebook and five for YouTube. All you need to do is ask a question, uh, put yourself into the feed there, uh, we'll get these out to you. Uh, the, uh, this is a great gift or a great giveaway for anybody who goes down and does a little bit of treasure hunting. Now look, uh, good luck there, keep watching uh, and you'll see later on in the show if you scored one of these great packs. Stick around uh, for this week's, now stick around for this week's top tip with Nathan and that is changing the pressure block on the GPZ 7000. G'day, I'm Nathan from Miners Den Authorised Service Centre and tonight's tech tip, I'm going to show you how to replace the cam lock and pressure block rubbers on a GBZ 7000. Alright then, first step is to undo the shaft, undo the cam lock and spin it around. Now you're going to need a few tools, a couple of hole punches and a hammer. So what you want to do is you want to knock out these two pins on either side of the cam lock here and here and knock them out out, out ways, not in, in ways, out ways. So, like so, just be careful and make sure you don't hit the detector. Have to put a bit of force behind it. Like so, now we, one of the pins have fallen out and just put him aside and don't lose it, don't let it roll away. And now we do the other one. Go. we've got that one out. So now what we'll do is you pull the cam lock out like so and now you've got the two pressure, uh, pressure blocks here. Now you're going to take these off the cam lock and then replace it with another set. They're a bit tricky to get out. They should come away nicely. He's gone but we got him out. So now I've got two more. Now these are the uh, pressure block rubbers. What you do, you just push them on. Like so, he's on. And one more. Now that one's on as well. Now we've got the pressure blocks on the on the cam lock, and now we'll slide it back into the slots here and put it back on the shaft. It just slides in like so, and now we get one of the one of the metal pins we've got, and we'll just push it in, and then I'll need to tap it with the hammer to get it in properly. Like so. Might need to get the hole punch and just to finish it off. It can be quite tricky, but that's how we do it. It's the same with the other one. Start it up and then tap it in. Once again, I'll use the hole punch to finish it off. And that's it. And now, <laughs> the cam lock is tight and it won't retract at all. And that's how you replace a pressure lock rubber and cam lock on a GPZ 7000. And that was tonight's tech tip on the Mind Lab show. Okay, we're back now and it's time for us to have a quick look here at our training. So uh, just to recap, if you bought an SDC 2300, a GPX 5000, a GPZ 7000 or the GPX 6000, uh, we've got some training on now in Adelaide. We've got some training on there at the moment uh, for the SDC. I think I've got a few spots left there on the screen. The 6000 session's full on the Saturday and there's a number of spots still left on the 7000. So this is the only training sessions that we have happening in Adelaide uh, for this year. So if you're in Adelaide and you bought a machine through the Minus Den store over there and you want to do your training, there are still some spots left. I'm going to be over there to run that training. So of course also we have our last training sessions for the year in Bendigo and we've got a few spots still left in that. Again, 
once we finish these ones, we're not going to be running anymore until the weather cools off in March in 2022. So there's four spots left there. You can see one of them is 6,000. Again, is full. There's still a few spots on the 7 and the 5,000. So please, book. It's for free. Go onto the website, minusden.com.au. Have a look at the dates that are available there. Select a date that suits you. And there's only a few left for this year now, but give the store a call, your local store, and they'll be able to book you in free of charge, and you'll be able to learn uh, all about how to use your machine, which will certainly make it so that you can find more gold coins and relics when you're out hunting. Now, of course, uh, don't forget about Sydney. There's a Sydney training session coming up on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of December. I'll have some more to say and some numbers. I think there's still a couple of spots left there now. If you're wanting to get into a Sydney training session, give uh, the guys a call, Sarah or Thomas at the uh, Sydney store, and those guys will be able to, again, book you in for those sessions uh, if you want to learn more about using your machine. So, uh, minusden.com.au, if you haven't but bought from us, you can still book in for that. There's a small charge on there and we'll still show you everything you need to know from the MineLab experts on MineLab certified training exclusive to Miners Den. All right, once we've got through that, if you're not training, let's give you some information now in our top tip for this week. G'day folks, this is the Coffee Bush Kid and today's top tip on the MineLab show is when to change from an 11 inch coil to a six inch coil to maximize what you'll find in the ground. Well, what we're gonna do is, I'll show you a little example of why I would change from an 11 inch coil to a six inch coil. And the main reason is, is when you have so many signals in the ground that you just don't know which way to turn. So what we do, is I've got some quartz here, and if I just, set them up semi-randomly, we'll say, like about there, you yeah, know, that, that's a good one. It's not unusual in a very trashy site to have that many targets in that area. Now, if you've got your, your 11 inch coil on your Equinox 800 and it goes over there, you can see right away that we have six targets underneath 11 inches of coil and it's going to go off its face. Even with some discrimination attached, you're still going to get a lot of mixed signals and should I do it, should I do it, shouldn't I do it? And you may just miss something that you really want to find. Now, if we were to take the 11 inch coil off and swap it over with the old six inch coil, even if I swing in the middle of that, I've just about knocked out four targets and I'm only concentrating on two. Even if we come down to here, it's sort of mostly two, three targets maybe that you're getting at a single point. And when you're swinging over, that means that the computer in the Equinox doesn't have to jamble all the signals around and that. It can go, oh, yep, this one's a good one. Let's dig him. And you'll find it becomes a lot quieter. You can concentrate more without being absolutely overloaded and to me it's just a better system of detecting that'll increase the fines that you you'll be able to get out of the ground right well i've shown you the in theory principle on the concrete with the 11 inch coil and the six inch coil with the stones but here's a little setup here now and this is the 11 inch coil going over multiple signals you can hear how there's which one's what? I have them all underneath the coil and it's just hard to discern what might be there. So what we'll do now is we'll swap to the six inch and you'll be able to hear the difference. Right, well I've swapped from the 11 inch coil to the six inch coil and now we can go over the same area and here it's a lot quieter, less noisy, less congested than what the 11 inch coil was. And in fact, we can now, one single target. There it is, right in the middle of all of them.
And that's the beauty of the six inch coil because it hasn't, it's not covering the great amount of area that the 11 inch was. And you can really, really pinpoint where the targets are. So I hope you've seen with the difference between the 11 and the six inch that in trashy ground, the six inch coil really comes into its own and it would be a magnificent piece of kit to have in your arsenal because it'll just get in amongst all the trash, pick out the jewels in the crown and you'll be very happy with the after effects. So, I'm the Coffee Bush Kid and that's been the top tip for the Mind Lab Show. Okay, well that's another fantastic tip there. Thanks again uh, to the Coffee Bush Kid. Uh, we'll keep bringing some more of those segments with uh, him in the next few episodes, that's for sure. Now, uh, we're nearly at the time when we're going to have our demo days running. Minus 10 demo days, uh, as you would have well know by now, these are the places where you go if you're looking to get a new detector and you want to see the whole range. So you want to get a bit of an idea on what might suit you, what their price points are, what the weight of the machine is, those kind of things, what batteries you need, other bits and pieces. It's all covered in these one-off day, and it's the only one we can run for this year. It's on Saturday, December the 4th. Um, and, of course, on those days, all of Gold Digger Dave's or Miner's Den's 12 days of Christmas specials will be available. So, if you're new, then you cannot afford to miss this. A team of Mine Lab experts and the Miner's Den staff all there to look after you and make sure you get the correct machine for your needs. If you're new to the game, like I said, you can't miss it. Uh, we're going to feed you from our barbie as well, so uh, we rock our kick off around about 10.30 in the morning. Uh, you'll go down to the park or across uh, to the, the bush uh, if you're in Bendigo. We'll take you through everything, bring you back, feed you and give you all the information you need to make sure you're making the correct decision for what you want to do with your hobby. Whether you want to go hunting for gold or whether you'd like to hunt for coins and relics. All stores on the 4th of December, Saturday the 4th of December. I'm going to be over at the Adelaide one, so I'm heading over there to do the show next week from there, as I've mentioned earlier, and uh, I'll be attending the demo day in Adelaide. So if you're over in Adelaide you want to learn some more, please drop in. I'd love to say hello. Now, it's time for us to uh, do a quick check again on Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt. So we've um, had uh, 10-year-old Jesse has scored over 5 grams of gold from his 700 bag of pay dirt. Uh, Sarah found 1.5 grams uh, uh, in her bag of pay dirt and Lee had great fun washing her bag and that was 1.3 grams of gold. I still have some Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt left uh, so if you wanted to get some and you haven't tried it before head to minersden.com.au go to our uh, pay dirt uh, there you'll find we've got different combos of it. You can pick up a 700 gram bag that'll uh, nice uh, size there. If you want to get a little bit more there's a 950 gram bag I think it's going out 133 to 700 gram bag uh, that one was around about the 79.50, I believe. However, if you've got a big group of people that want to have the joy of going with Gold Digger Dave's a gourmet pay dirt, then why not grab yourself our 4.5 kilo tub? So in that tub, you're going to be guaranteed a return of some fine golden nuggets, and you'll get somewhere around about 65 to 70 percent return, just depending on the the bucket. Of course. There is some of the tubs that you uh, uh, will also find have got a mini patch in them as well. So by all means, hit the mini patches up. $1,000 guaranteed return on that one. If you haven't got a panning thing, there's combos of the, the pay dirt with panning kits, combos with uh, our mini panning kit, all that kind of stuff. And of course, we're coming up towards the end of November. And if you have bought some pay dirt and haven't entered your photo in, for the Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt Photo Competition, and that is a mouthful, I must say, um, then please drop it in to be in the chance uh, to have a win a $50 gift card from Miner's Den. So you just go to our um, pin post, uh, over $50,000 worth of gold uh, in every bucket or every batch, and you'll find that there's both nuggets and fine gold in there. Uh, the pin post on Facebook, Put your photo of your finds up there and the gift card could be yours. The uh, November one is obviously drawing to a close. Uh, now, with uh, that, I've got to say this. As per usual, Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt 
it's no ordinary gravel. So, once we've dealt with the pay dirt, we're now going to go and find out in our section, our, in our segment, Gals on the Goldfield with Rhonda, and tonight we're going to have a look at the life of Harriet Lancel. G'day, Rhonda here with another segment of Gals on the Goldfields, and today I'm at George Lancel's 180 Mine. And today I'm talking about a very important part of his life, his wife Harriet Edith Lancel. Harriet was George's second wife after the death of his first wife, Bedelia. Now George Lancel was a very, very rich man. He was known as the Quartz King of Bendigo and he was a fabulously rich mining magnate during the Victorian Gold Rush. In 1880, after the death of his first wife, when his spirits were at an incredibly all-time low, George returned to his birthplace in England. And this is where he met Harriet. Now, he already knew Harriet because Harriet was Although she was born in England, she'd been raised in Bendigo. So these two got together and in 1883, they got married. Harriet was aged 27 and George was aged 60. They went on to have five sons and one daughter and George was overjoyed to become a father. During that time, Bendigo was going through a downturn in mining. So 2,628 people signed a petition begging George to return to Bendigo because they felt that he brought prosperity and great wealth to our city. So return they did. They had been away for seven years, so they returned home to Fortuna Villa, which George had purchased in 1871. Now, a big family needs a big home, so they set about renovating Fortuna Villa. They added many, many levels and 40 new rooms. With Harriet's keen eye and flair for decorating, she remodelled the grounds of the house around it was beautiful rolling lawns, garden beds full of the most exotic plants, there were lakes, there were statues, there were fountains, there were Roman baths. What a wonderful place to raise a family. No expense was spared on the house either, it was filled with treasures from all around the world. Harriet certainly had her hands full rearing all those children. There were so many cousins and friends to play with. It would have just been amazing living there. There are stories of them roller skating on the balconies, rowing on the lake, having picnics, playing hide and seek in the garden or climbing the giant trees out the front of Fortuna Villa. What a wonderful place. The kids got paid to work at the stamper battery next door for pocket money. At one point they even had a pet monkey. Harriet certainly would have had her hands full keeping that lot in line. Like George, Harriet was a great philanthropist, donating her time and energy to many great causes. After George's death in 1906 at the age of 82, Harriet continued with his charitable works and she was very well respected in the community. She also found time to complete the renovations on the Fortuna Villa. She oversaw all the work of this and in 1907, it was finally done. And it was the jewel in Bendigo's crown and still is to this day. Harriet died in March 1934 at the age of 78. The Bishop of the Anglican Church conducted her service and as the cortege passed through Bendigo, crowds lined the street standing in silence. A fitting tribute to a woman who contributed so much to her community. Well, what a significant lady and the family certainly had a massive impact on the early days in the Bendigo and Victorian gold fields. Now, we're up to our store offer today, so we're just going to move on uh, and have a bit of a chat about that. This is our 12 days of Christmas promotion. Now, we only do this, obviously, once a year at Christmas time. And you can see our calendar up there. What we've got stacked in is all of the deals going from the 23rd of November through to the 4th of December uh, each day with a different detector. In some cases, we've got a couple of detectors up there uh, on an absolute smashing deal. Uh, what you can find is yesterday we had the GoFind range on. Uh, there was a couple of GoFinds up there that had some extra gear added with it. Today, we've actually got on the Vanquish range of machines. So we've got the three 40 and the 440, the vanquishers. So we've got our smashing price there, uh, 348 and 448. It's uh, equal best, if not the best in Australia. It also 
comes with free AA batteries, so you can get yourself up and running on that. Uh, free book uh, beach carving with a metal detector, so there's only a few of those uh, left in the stores now. And, of course, uh, a greens of rubbish and fines bag. Now, uh, this deal, the way it works, we put up a new deal at 12 p.m. every day through till the 4th of December. And as we're going through, if you see an item and you want to pick that up or you miss an item and you haven't been able to pick that up, what's left in the items and the offers that we've got left over all will go live on the 4th of December. Now, the 4th of December is also the demo day around all the stores. If you get in there, you'll certainly find that you're able to uh, pick yourself up a bargain. If you're thinking about buying any detector, just keep your eye on this sale and you're sure to save a lot with the 12 days of Christmas from Miner's Den. So, uh, we'll see what comes up in the next, uh, the next one at 12 o'clock tomorrow. And if you're looking for accessories, we haven't forgotten about you either. The accessories also, a range of accessories each day will be going up at 12 p.m. for 24 hours on a super special deal. How do you find out about what's the next one? Simply head to the Facebook page, Miner's Den, and you'll be able to have a look there where the next offer comes up at 12. Uh, so 24 hours only. A couple of the offers that are coming up later in the campaign are absolutely going to blow you away. So please hold your pennies until you see your machine come up and uh, we'll get you into the right gear with training and covers and all that kind of stuff that you would expect from the leading outlet for Mine Lab Metal Detectors, Miner's Den Australia. So keep checking with that and uh, you'll certainly find that uh, you'll get yourself a, a bargain. Now, let's not forget, there's an offer also from Mine Lab that's currently on till the end of the month, so you haven't got long to get on to this. Finishes, I think, this one around about the, the end of uh, November, and that is the SDC 2300. It's been paired up with a ProSonic wireless audio unit, so that's $400 worth of audio unit for absolutely nix. And you'll find comes with its cover, training, and service backed by one of the leading service outlets in Australia for MindLab. Uh, there's the MindLab factory, or there's us over here, and I think there might be one or two others around. So if you've got to get repaired or anything like that, chances are your detector's going to end up coming back through our store at some stage where we'll get it working in perfect order for you. Now, don't forget also, Coiltech are going with an offer at the moment. Uh, they're giving you 10% off uh, on any of the Coiltech Extreme coils for the SDC 2300. So there's a few sizes there. There's the 11 inch, which is uh, great for getting a little bit of extra depth. Of course, you've got the 14 by nine. Uh, that 14 by nine is good if you're trying to cover a little bit more area. It's a little bit easier to pinpoint with because it is an elliptical coil. And of course, that small 10 by five, which is great for poking in around some of those uh, bushy areas and things like that. Uh, you'll also get a free bonus gift pack, which has got a cap and a tote bag. I think might be a stubby holder or something in there as well. And to make things even sweeter for you, Miner's Den are offering uh, those coils to be posted out to you free of charge. So that's the call tech extreme coils for the SDC 2300. I think that offer goes till somewhere around about the 15th of uh, December. So you go a little bit longer if you want to get in and uh, get yourself onto that deal. Uh, head to minusden.com.au or visit one of the local stores. Um, so, uh, huge buying power helps us get these deals and get them at the right price for you. Now, look, uh, we're looking here at something uh, uh, that I've been wanting to do for a long, long time, and it looks like it's going to happen this time. It's going to happen on the 1st of December, which is next week. I'm going across to the Mine Lab factory, and we're going to take you with our show and have a bit of a look inside. So if you've ever wondered what happens inside the uh, bowels of the world's greatest metal detecting company, you will get a chance to walk through 
with me on the Mind Lab show. So that's going to be uh, 7.30 Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time uh, next week. And I'm really looking forward to it as Gold Digger Dave runs amok at Mind Lab Metal Detector Headquarters. It's going to be fun. There's going to be lots of prizes and things like that. And it'll show you the hard-working and dedicated people that are continually delivering a cutting-edge technology to prospectors uh, ahead, well ahead of the time and well ahead of uh, any of the other companies that are out in the marketplace. So that I am really, really pleased about. That's why we're heading to Adelaide. Going to be over there soon. So by all means, uh, live from my lab headquarters in Adelaide, South Australia, episode 65 of the Mind Lab show, 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday. So 7.30 Australian Eastern Daylight Time. I think it's probably 7 p.m. in Adelaide or 6.30 if you're up in sunny Queensland. So uh, that's, uh, can't wait for that all to happen. Uh, really, really been uh, looking forward to it. And yeah, there's gonna be some uh, really good stuff happen over there. So. Uh, next, uh, we're going to have a bit of a look at our viewer questions now. So the viewer questions tonight, I've got a couple of them here. Uh, the first one up is a question from Philip, and uh, Philip's asking about trading tokens. He'd like to learn a little more about trading tokens, please. Well, we've got the coffee bush kid back now, and he's going to give you a bit of a run through on uh, what tokens are and what they're used for. G'day folks, I'm the Coffee Bush Kid and today we're going to talk about a magnificent little find that occasionally pops up when you're out swinging the coil and that is the token. Some people refer to them as trading tokens or just trade tokens. We normally call them just tokens and they are a brilliant little find. A common question that I'm asked is what actually is a token? Now a token was an unofficial coin that was put into the monetary system of Australia and New Zealand back in the early days of the colony. Now the reason that they came into existence was that there was a shortage of small change back in the early days. There were still silvers with threepences and sixpences and shillings, but as far as small change, half pennies and pennies seemed to be very scarce on the ground. Right, well when did tokens start? The first official copper tokens were put out in 1849 by Annan, Smith & Co. And uh, they were family grocers in Melbourne and they put out the first one penny token. Now, who did put the tokens out? Most tokens were put out by business owners. Uh, so they were examples of family grocers, drapers, ironmongers, wine and spirit merchants, uh, pawnbrokers, and auctioneers. But there were actually some that were just a generic token that were put out, like the Peace and Plenty tokens that we'll quite often find in the gold fields. With all the business owners that put them out, all of them were male, except for Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher was a draper in South Yarra in Melbourne. And in 1857, she put out a half penny token. And that is the only token that was put out by a woman in those times. Now tokens were received in small change, but what R. Parker of Moorable Street, Geelong would do, was he would get barrels of tokens in off the ships. He had a glass fronted window. He'd break open a barrel and put a sign at the front of it saying, small change available. Now people would then bring their threepences and sixpences and shillings in and get the equivalent value of one penny and half penny tokens uh, for their exchange. Then they could go off, buy what they needed to buy and knew that they had the right money or could receive the right change for their purchase. So that is a brief history on tokens. Uh, what they are, what they were used for and who put them out. So. When you're out swinging in the bush, or in fact even in the backyard, you just might be lucky to come across one. When you do, just take the time to look at it and, and really marvel at this little snapshot of our early colonial history. I'm the Coffee Bush Kid, and that's an insight into trading tokens for the Mind Lab Show.
Well, we certainly uh, went to the right person, our resident uh, treasure hunter, the Coffee Bush Kid. And he'll be back next week with uh, some more fantastic information for the coin and treasure hunter. So, uh, our next question this week came from Paul. And Paul uh, is asking about uh, footwear uh, for going on his detector. So he's, uh, he said, what should someone wear to protect against the elements, but in particular, what, foot, what about footwear? What footwear should a person wear to protect against snake bite? Well, that's a great question uh, there, Paul. Um, to protect against snake bite, it depends on what footwear you're actually got. If you're trying to get boots and things like that, you're going to find a lot of those boots that are around do have uh, metal and things in them. Now, if you're like me, I like to be comfortable when I'm out detecting, so I'll be wandering around uh, with a pair of sand shoes or something like that on. Now, if I've got sand shoes on, the best way to protect my feet, I've found, is to wear an actual um, uh, snake guard. So we've got some snake guards that are just on their way in um, and that will protect you. Uh, covers, uh, make sure to cover the entire uh, top of, the, uh, the, of your foot there with the snake guard. So if the snake happens to bite, he's not going to get through the rubber, he's not going to get through into the top of your foot. And this was a very uh, timely question there, Paul, because uh, we've just had arrive in the, uh, and it's, please, just excuse me for the green there, guys, it's going to drop out a little bit, uh, the Miner's Den Snake Bite uh, Kit. Okay, it's come out from uh, First Aid Australia kits, so uh, reputable brand and everything there. These great little kits, I'm just going to pack one here for you, have three of the crepe bandages in for bandaging yourself up if you happen to get bitten. We've got a texture in there, and I think you use that to mark the area where the bite was in. Uh, we have, and again, the green on this doesn't really come up well, but you're not going to believe this. This is a thermal shock blanket. It's uh, as big as you can see there. And uh, this thing's 185 centimetres by 130 centimetres. So more than enough to keep you, well, warm if you're uh, in shock. Your little toe might stick out or something like that. But um, uh, it is a good kit to have. Of course, a little gauze there and a handy thing if you've got a snake bite kit, uh, usually you need to know how to use it. This little card here is uh, going to help you out with that. There's five simple steps there to make sure you apply those uh, elastic crepe bandages correctly and give yourself uh, uh, a good chance of uh, making sure you get through without anything uh, happening to you as a result of a snake bite. Now, I'll pack it all back into there. Uh, of course, uh, it is just designed for snakes. You can buy bigger kits and things like that, but uh, we thought a snake bite kit's probably very good for this time of year. So all packs up nice and small like you can see there. On the side here I've got a little uh, pocket there that I can uh, put the belt through if I want to put it onto my hip or something like that. Very, very handy. At 18 bucks you'd be mad to be walking around down in the uh, bush there without one of these snake bite kits on your actual uh, hip there or in your backpack. So that's the uh, snake bite kit. It's small and compact. It's lightweight. Um, it had all the stuff that I unpacked there in it for you, and it's available at minersden.com.au. And speaking of which, we've just gone through a major upgrade to our new website, uh, theminersden.com.au. So we're going to have a bit of a see. We can have a bit of a look uh, at that site live now. Okay, so we can see it here. We've got uh, sites come up. We've got a few things that we can do here. So we're going to go up to our shop all, uh, just show you how this works a little bit. You can drop down onto your metal detectors from there. You can then select your different types of detectors. It's all nice and easily laid out there for you now. Um, if we go and have a look uh, at the page, we've also got a couple of buttons you can actually click and move around. So we've got our hide filter button. So we can make our pictures bigger on here and we can go back to our hide filter or show filters and you've also got all your categories down the side nice and easy for you to get some stuff from. Of course if you want to go and have a look at the view you can change it between having three uh, on the screen or having uh, four uh, across uh, and again you're able to drop in and out with the uh, show filter button. So it's my big improvement on what we've had there. We always had a really nice looking site. This one's got bigger pictures. We're starting to upgrade all the information and things on it for you. So if you're looking to purchase something online, Miners Den have just made it easier for you. Lots of stuff down the bottom there, or helpful links and things like that. We're back to our home page, a bit of pay dirt there you can see and uh, a little bit of info all about Australia's leading outlet for MineLab metal detectors. So uh, that's our new website. Now look, I'd like you guys, if you 
can have a look on there. If you find any things that uh, aren't working or you, you, you're not liking or if you're finding things equally that you'd like to tell us about, jump on, uh, send uh, Corey an email or uh, drop into the feed there on our Facebook page. Let us know. Maybe there's some improvements we can do. Maybe you've got some ideas that uh, uh, we can put in. So we're still shipping daily. Everything's still working on. It's been a very smooth transition. Minersden.com.au is uh, a new website ready for you to explore. So now we're going to move along a little bit and we're going to go out and do some gold hunting in Queensland. Let's head off to Charters Towers. Located less than 150 kilometres from Townsville in Queensland, Charters Towers was once Queensland's second largest city, with a population at the time of around 25,000. We've all heard the saying, bigger than Texas, but today, the Charters Towers local council looks after an area bigger than Tassie. The discovery of a gold nugget way back in 1871 led to the outback town of Charters Towers being established. Thousands of diggers again flooded an area in the colonies looking to strike it rich and these gold fields would go on to give up over 200 tonnes of gold. These days, while the gold rush has long since passed, Charters Towers is a thriving outback hub with a booming farming sector and plenty of rich reminders of that golden era. And more importantly, savvy prospectors are still turning up gold nuggets with their detectors. The original find is a good story in itself. History tells us that around 1871, a group of prospectors were searching for gold in the area when a thunderstorm caused their horses to bolt and break from camp. A young Aboriginal boy named Jupiter was riding with the group and it was while rounding up the horses that he is said to have found a gold nugget. On closer inspection of the area, the rest of the party saw plenty of rich quartz and it wouldn't be long before they'd discover nearly a dozen more rich reefs. When the group named their claim, they chose Charters Towers because Charters was the name of the then Gold Commissioner and Towers was because of the shape of the surrounding hills. As had occurred in other rushes around the colonies, it wasn't long before somewhere between three and 5,000 diggers were working the gold fields. While over 200 tonnes of gold has already left the ground here, there's a spot called Young's Block that is still popular with prospectors today. You can find other areas worth going over too, using the many resources made available to visitors through the various Queensland Government online sites. Charters Towers offers many insights into the Gold Rush era, with museums, tours and plenty of ghostly reminders of diggers past. A visit to Charters Towers is a great way to taste life in the outback, but these days you really can have the best of both worlds, with countless quality options available for quality accommodation and camping. Okay, well, that was another gold hotspot there. Hope you enjoyed that one, guys, uh, up in Queensland. We try and go around the states, vary them around a little bit. Uh, it's come to that time of the night where it's got to announce the uh, winners of tonight's viewer giveaway. So just to recap on the viewer giveaway, if you're heading down the beach, you're going to need one of these coin and relic uh, hunters and you're going to need one of these. So keep the sun off your head and get your targets out of the ground extremely quickly with the Miner's Den Red Sand Scoop. So there's 10 of those to give away tonight, and I've got some winners. I'm just going to read a few of you out here now. Um, firstly, we've got Peter D, or Pete D, thank you. Mick R, you've got one from Facebook there as well. Terry L, congratulations, you're in on Facebook. Steve M, you've scored one. And Wayne D, that's all the Facebook ones, so we'll put that up in the feed. If you're on YouTube, Gary L, you scored a, a pack there. Uh, uh, Tony P, you've got a pack. Alan C, you've got a pack. And uh, a coin tector, see, I'll spell this one out. It's C O I N T E C 
uh, T-E-D-O-R. So the, you've scored one as well. And Carissa G, you've scored a pack also. So all those names will go up into the uh, Facebook uh, feed there with a list of all the winners. If you're a winner, just jump on board, uh, let Corey know that you've uh, won a prize, and we'll get those out to you uh, in the next day or so, and you'll be ready to head down to the beach with your new bucket hat and a Miner's Den a red sand scoop. Now, if you missed out on uh, the prize this evening, don't worry about it, because we're going to have more of them next week, and we're just starting to get organised uh, for uh, a lot more prizes and things. Of course... At this time of night, it's time to take a little preview on what might be happening uh, in Adelaide next weekend. So, to sign off here, I'm going to uh, thank you all for joining me for this episode, but can't wait for you all to be on the feed when we go to MindLab headquarters in South Australia, Adelaide. So this is the worldwide headquarters. This is where all the thinking, all the tech stuff, all that kind of thing is put together. We're going to take you for Gold Digger Dave's guided walk through there as I run amok at MindLab Metal Detector headquarters. So uh, we're going to say hello to a bunch of dedicated people uh, who are going to be delivering uh, the cutting edge technology, as we said. We'll give away some fantastic gear. Uh, hopefully I can raid the uh, prize cupboard or something like that. And we'll bring you a number of the usual segments that you've got used to on the Mind Lab show. I'm Gold Digger Dave from Miner's Den, and you've been watching the Mind Lab show. Thanks for watching. Remember, like, subscribe, and share. Tune in next week for another episode of the Mind Lab show.